Good afternoon, Sandra Turner, uh, speaking to the world from London. Um, welcome to the this afternoon's webinar, um, sponsored by MidVision and Spot QA. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today is accelerating release cycles using release automation and continuous testing. Uh, the webinar will last approximately 45 minutes, including questions and answers. Um, and we're glad that you're here. So thanks for joining us. Uh, the agenda for today is we're going to cover some webinar logistics at the beginning. Then we're going to uh, cover who's actually going to be co-presenting and co-supporting uh, co this particular uh, webinar this afternoon. We'll do some introductions. Uh, then we'll, we're going to cover a short uh, few slides just to explain the context of why we believe this is an important topic to discuss today, uh, given the, uh, the impact of software in organizations uh, globally. Uh, and then what we're going to do is hand over to do a live demo walkthrough of capabilities of MidVision and Spot QA to show you in real life how you can apply their capabilities and platforms into your organization. So then we're going to open it up to questions and answers, uh, and then we'll do a quick wrap up and uh, share some information about you being able to understand a bit more about both organizations to follow up from today's webinar. So to just go through logistics, thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, wherever you are in the, in the West Coast, in the East Coast, in uh, Europe or in Asia, uh, we're going to be using Zoom webinar, uh, which will uh, make a recording available on YouTube and various social media channels post this session. Uh, we're, we're actually going to mute the session for all attendees, but we will uh, open up for questions and answers at the beginning. You can actually submit your questions through the button at the bottom of the screen. Um, and obviously look forward to an interactive uh, interactive session where you can provide Q&A and we can have a discussion about the kind of things that you may be interested in. So hopefully it stimulates some, some good discussion and helps, helps you to understand more about what this is about. So who is joining me on this session? So as I said, my name is Andrew Turner. I host a podcast called the G&T Sessions, which is about growth and technology. Uh, so I'm happy to be uh, joined today by Richard Betterson, who is the co-founder and CTO of MidVision. Hi, Richard. Hi, Andrew. I'm here. Thanks for joining us. Um, and I'm also joined by um, Nishant Bashir, who is also the CTO and Global Head of Engin Sales Engineering for Spot QA. Uh, hi, hi, Nishant. Are you there? Hi, Andrew. Um, thanks for the intro. Um, hi, guys. So... Um, both organizations, uh, MidVision and Spot QA, are headquartered in London, although they have operations globally uh, and have customers uh, from you know, Australia through to the West Coast of America. So um, it's good that we got both Nishan and Richard on the call so they can share their experiences from their uh, working with customers across the world. So why are we here? What, what, what's, the, what's the relevance to uh, this topic that we're talking about? Uh, in the context of the world today. So um, the, the, there is a, there's a gentleman called Mark Andreessen, who you may have heard of. I hope you've heard of him. He's, um, he was the, the co-founder of a company called Netscape, which was one of the very, very early browser technologies that was built uh, before Internet Explorer was Microsoft and obviously Chrome from Google and Apple from Safari. Um, he then went on to found a number of other companies uh, and also then uh, successfully set up a venture capital firm in Silicon Valley uh, called Andreas and Horowitz with a guy called Ben Horowitz. And they have been um, a very successful venture firm around supporting software innovators and entrepreneurs in, in how software is now eating the world. Um, software is becoming intrinsically embedded in all our daily lives. The advent of the iPhone, the, you know, the Android uh, mobile phone industry, et cetera, et cetera. And every organization now has to consider how it can use software to look after its customers and grow as an organization. And one of those organizations that you probably have heard of and you've watched uh, grow and uh, become more and more visible in the, in the world is a company founded by Elon Musk, who was one of the co-founders of PayPal, um, is a company called Tesla. So um, if, I don't know if anybody on this call has got, actually got a Tesla car, but if you have, you probably recognize some of this, uh, this dashboard where 
even today you can actually effectively interact with the software upgrade that you apply into your Tesla motor car. Uh, they have a very big console, big rig screen inside the Tesla Motor S Model S. And um, obviously what it shows is how software is becoming embedded into vehicles uh, in, you know, in comparison to Henry Ford when he created the Model T Ford when the only color he could have was black um, many, many years ago. It's amazing how uh, you know, example of the automotive automotive industry has moved forward to where sensors and um, software is embedded to in ensure you can drive safely and obviously drive within comfort and with the, all of the, the creature comforts that you would expect with a, a modern vehicle. So we talked about software is eating the world, but also there's this concept called AI, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, and that's becoming a lot more visible in the press and in the public, uh, the public knowledge and public awareness. Um, some people are saying that it's potentially a, it's not for good, but obviously I think that the whole, the whole garden, guardian and the go governance around this, um, this phenomenon is important to manage carefully. And this is Jensen Huang from uh, NVIDIA, uh, the CPU and hardware acceleration company, last year explaining that the impact of AI on software, where obviously the interaction between humans and, and machines, uh, think about you know Arnold Schwarzenegger, think about Terminator, think about all those kind of the Skynet and everything like that. This is where the, these types of concepts are now coming to the fore, um, where the opportunity is using software to, uh, to take a lot of the, you know, you could say mundane or repetitive tasks and do things at scale, uh, but also make sure that you control that with a, a good, uh, a good deal of human interaction. So as a segue from software, the, there is a, a concept called DevOps. Uh, so how developers and operations people within your technology teams in your organization, how they interact and how will they work as one team to deliver software at scale and at speed and, and with quality. So many, many years ago, there was a guy called Ilya Goldratt who wrote a book called The Goal which is about managing the theory of constraints about how you manage bottlenecks within a manufacturing plant and the, and the, and the journey of Jonah as the manufacturing manager of how he improved the operation of his factory. Now the analogy with uh, the advent of the Phoenix project was taking that analogy into the software domain and showing how there are a lot of analogies to how software is effectively evolving into being a software factory and a manufacturer of capability for organizations. And just literally this month, uh, Gene has also co-authored with Jez Humble, who's the co-author of uh, in, uh, Continuous Delivery, uh, and Nicole Forsgren, who's also the CEO of Dora, which is a DevOps research um, group that's in, based in California. They've released this new book called Accelerate, because organizations now are seeing the opportunity and the value from uh, DevOps or dev test ops, dev test sec ops, et cetera, to effectively operate their ability to deliver value into the hands of the customer. Whether it's a mobile banking application, whether it's a healthcare application, running hospitals or dealing with patient, um, patient journeys, or dealing with something like a, um, a retail experience, an omni-channel experience in a, in a store with a, with a customer who wants to get some service. So doing that at scale, is obviously another set of learnings from an, an enterprise level. So it's all about how do you move that code, that valuable asset, that, that, that set of code that developers have, have built as a feature uh, and a capability from development into production, and how do you develop and deliver that software faster, but with a speed and safety, um, with, you know, with quality in mind as well. So one of the concepts that's come through that is this concept of pipelines. So we've got our own little pipeline here, uh, taking you from the development side here, right through to production. And you have a set of stages and you have a set of gates you have to move through from committing the, the code from the, maybe the, the, the developer's laptop into a source code repository like GitHub. For example, it was just recently bought by Microsoft for multi-billion dollars, uh, which Andreas and Horowitz did quite nicely out of. Um, or um, also moving it into a build, a build, you know, actual releasable application that you can then integrate with the rest of your suite of applications or mobile mobile app banking apps, for example, 
to then maybe stage it and scale it from one server to 10 servers to hundreds to thousands of servers. Because obviously uh, in a mobile banking you know, scenario, you don't just have one user, you have potentially millions of users using the application at the same time. And what we're trying to get across with this slide is there is a, there's two steps to the process. There's an upstream process where you, you effectively do the development through to having a testable application that you can move into production. And then you have a, a process where you have downstream where you have to scale the application and, and release that application into production. What we're trying to say here is that based on some information from CloudBees, who are the authors of, of Jenkins, literally this month they published some interesting statistics about the maturity of these different processes. So what they were saying was that even though the upstream process have moved from literally months and weeks, days to hours, and even minutes in certain companies, um, on, the, on the downstream processes, they are still a, taking weeks and months at some, in some cases to, to deploy at scale. So the focus of today's session is to say, okay, how does automation, how is that key to changing how you change these cycle times and reduce the cycle times to be, to, be, to be less and you drive that software delivery through the process better and at safety and at speed. So I'm now gonna hand over to uh, Richard and Nishant uh, to take you through a scenario showing you how Midvision and Spot QA combined give you that ability to accelerate those release cycles using release automation platforms, using this continuous testing platforms that they provide to give you that result. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so hello, everyone. So today we're gonna to run a uh, relatively simple demo, or at least the output is gonna be relatively simple. So what we've got here is a Java web app running uh, in uh, Amazon uh, on this server, on this port, is the JPET store application. It's a very simple application and you can see it has this sort of powder blue background color. So what we're gonna do in this demonstration is we're gonna show um, a, a requirement to change that background color from powder blue to green. Developers are gonna go and make that change. They are going to uh, accidentally change the color from, blue, from powder blue to pink instead of green. That's gonna go through um, the build process, some unit tests, it's gonna get deployed to a target environment. And then we're gonna call Spot QA, uh, and that's gonna check that uh, color as one, of its, as one of its tests. And it's gonna see that it's not actually not the green color that we expect, it's a, it's, a, it's a different color. And then what that's gonna do is that's gonna fail that test. That will fail the job, we'll call a failure pipeline or a failure branch, which will put the color back to powder blue. Uh, it will also raise a ticket in Jira. The developer will then go and make the change uh, uh, again to put the correct color, and then we'll deploy the correct color through uh, to our environment. Okay, so first thing we're gonna do is go into Eclipse. So I've got my JPET store application here, um, and the background color is currently uh, powder blue. So I'm now gonna change that to green, uh, sorry, to pink. Okay, so now that's a pink color. Okay, and I'm now gonna commit that. And I'm just gonna say blue to green because that's what we think we're doing. Okay, and that's gonna commit. You see it's doing a commit to subversion here, which is the SCM repository that's backing our development stream. Okay, and what that's gonna do We've also got Jenkins running in the background and we have a Jenkins project, JBoss Continuous Delivery 41 demo server. And if we go and look at the configuration of that, we'll be able to see that um, using this URL, which is our SVN repository, it's polling that repository every two minutes. And if it detects a code change, that will invoke a build. The build is running a standard Maven build with our POM and a clean install. And then uh, the output from that build will be a war file. It will run some unit tests and then it will generate a war file. Uh, and then we've got some post build steps. And here we're using the uh, rapid deploy uh, Jenkins plugins. There are three plugins, we're using two of them. 
the three plugins are build a package, uh, call a project job, and call a pipeline, which is a, basically a combination of project jobs and pipeline steps. So this one is just calling a project job. So we put in here the uh, URL uh, to connect to our MidVision uh, Rapid Deploy server and a uh, authentication token, which we generate on the Rapid Deploy server and put it in there. And then load projects and we'll see all of the various projects we have in that Rapid Deploy instance. We're using this copy JPET store to Rapid Deploy. And what, basically what this is doing is taking the WAR file and copying it over to Rapid Deploy to be included in a deployment package. Now, we did, it's just one way of doing it. We could in fact use Rapid Deploy to pull it from a Maven repository, which is where it might have been put. Uh, or we could use Rapid Deploy to set up a resource that always polls that Maven repository and we'll pull the latest version, etc. Okay, then we have a Rapid Deploy job plan runner plugin. Well, this again, we just put in the server URL and the authentication token, and this time we get a list of job plans. So these are basically pipelines. So uh, here you can see all of the pipelines we've got installed. We've got a lot of pipelines here. Um, and we're calling this JBoss AS7 install configure deploy test uh, pipeline. And we're going to show all the full logs, which means the logs will be shown in Jenkins as well as in uh, Rapid Deploy. Okay, so if we now scroll back up, we can see that that build is in process. We can go and have a look at the console output. It's actually now starting to do the build. While that's running, I'm just going to log into Rapid Deploy. And then what we'll do is we'll go and have a look at that actual pipeline. So if we go on here, we look at the pipeline. So let's go and have a look at that. So this is the pipeline that we saw in our Jenkins configuration. So this pipeline has a start node and a finish node. All pipelines have a start and a finish node. They can also have zero or one rollback pipeline. So if we get to the finish node, we don't like what's been deployed. We can do a one click rollback and we can specify the version we want to roll back to. And any one of these uh, project jobs can have a failure branch. We've just got one. So what's happening here, we're starting. So this is the input from Jenkins. We're using a pipeline step automatically going on to run the first job. We can have multiple different pipeline steps. Uh, and the, the ones we've got will depend on which plugins we've got installed. The simplest is an auto step, just wait until all the jobs in the current step are finished and then go on to the next one. Also deploy an agent. We've got a file check step. This, this will, the file check step will basically uh, look for a trigger event on any target server. So we put the remote server in, then we can give a file path and then we can verify if the date on that file changes, the size, the content. So whether it appears or disappears. And then we can take an action based on that. Uh, we can also have a job plan execution step. This will enable us to invoke another job plan from this job plan, either synchronously or asynchronously. So we can either kick it and go, or we can kick it and wait uh, for it to return before we go on to the next uh, job in this pipeline. And the most important one probably is a rest call step. So here we can make a call out to any rest service we can get an expe expected successful response or a failure response. We can wait for a certain amount of time or forever, just keep polling, the polling interval. When we get the response, we'll take an action on it. We'll do one thing or another, depending on the response that we get. Okay, and then you've got these three actual um, jobs. This one is a JBoss AS7 installer job. So this, what this will do is it will say, well, if the server's not running, I'll, I'll create it. If, it. if it doesn't exist, I'll create it. Um, if it's not running, I'll start it. If it doesn't have JBoss installed on it, I'll install it. Right? Well, we know all those things are already true, so it's just really going to skip over that. This is another job which will set up our base configuration for JBoss. So it's going to deploy some configuration to that JBoss server. And then this job is actually going to deploy our WAR file. And you can see this says new version. So at the point of the start here, it's going to create a new package based on the new WAR file. And then it will promote that through our environments. Well, we've only got one environment, but if we had more, it would promote it through. And then we've got the Spot QA test suite, and this is actually going to call our Spot QA server, and that is going to run a headless test against the JPET Store application. And here's the JPET Store application, and check that that color is in fact uh, green. Okay, so let's see what JBoss is doing. Okay, JBoss is now uh, called Rapid Deploy. So let's actually go and see what's going on in the Rapid Deploy running jobs panel. 
you're going to go to now. Okay, so if we look at the actual pipeline and see where that's got to. So the pipeline is currently now deploying the uh, J, so it's already run through these two uh, jobs. It's now running the job to deploy the uh, new war file. Uh, we can look at the console output here to see the console output of the uh, pipeline. We can also look at the actual project job to see the output of that. So uh, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and have a look at the spot QA output. So we can click on here and see the spot QA output. So we can see all the tasks that we're running on the spot QA server. Some basic uh, tasks, and eventually we're actually going to call so some check tasks. And then we're going to call the script that is actually calling the spot QA server to actually run the tests. So here it's just copying or checking if those files exist. If they don't, it's copying them over. And then it's running each of the tasks. If we look at the console output, you can see it's already started. It's running the first task there, list files. And now it's actually running the uh, tests that we want to run. So it's going to run through those tests by calling a maven command. Uh, so here we can see the title of the page that we're getting. And then we can see here it says it failed to match with the expected color. So that's now going to fail the job. Uh, it's going to fail the test. The test will fail the job. The job will fail the deployment plan. And the deployment plan will then invoke the um, uh, failure pipeline to put back the original version. OK, so let's have a look at that. So here is the. The progress here is showing failure. It's called the um, failure pipeline. We can go and have a look at that. Now I set the fi failure pipeline to have a manual step so that I would have time to be able to show you that the color is in fact uh, pink. Okay, so it didn't deploy green, it deployed pink. Um, so I can now kick that off to just redeploy the original uh, color. And while that's going, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to look at the previous jobs in rapid deploy. We can see the failed job here, which is the last completed job. We can scroll down here and look through the jobs. We can see the three that succeeded and the one that failed. I'm going to click on the job that failed. We can see where that failed on the script code runner. We can view the individual logs for each piece, or we can view the whole log. I'm going to view the whole log because I want to search for a particular code here. OK. So here we can see that bit of logging where it said it failed to match with the expected color. We can then see that it's saying it's um, actually adding a defect ID to Jira. It's being logged in Jira with a defect ID 1116. And then you can see here the failure that happened and then the fact that the whole thing failed and that then caused that cascading failure right the, right, right the way back through. OK, so I think that other job has now uh, completed. So we ought to be able um, to see. Uh, sorry, sorry. Um, um... Rich, I think it's, was it only for me that I couldn't see the console, or is it for everyone? Uh, you want to go back and look at that console? Is yeah, that because I, it, the console did not show up on my screen, so I was just checking if it was only for me or if it was for everyone in the. Um... Okay, can you see it now? No, not yet. Yeah, I can see it, Rich. So... Okay, great. Okay, so. Um, OK, so here is that again, that's defect ID, the fact the defect is logged in Jira, OK? And, um, you know, the fact that the job marked has failed. And then, um, you know, we can see that that causes the ca cascading fail. OK, and that's, that's what we're showing here. So uh, if we now uh, go back and look at pipeline jobs, um, we refresh this page. Uh, we should see that we've now got the success of the failure pipeline. So that's been successful. So we go and look at the JPET store, and now we refresh this. We'll see that we've gone back to the powder blue. OK, so what I'm now going to do is I'm actually going to make the correct change now. Right here. So this can run in the background while I hand over to um, Nishant to, uh, to go through and um, show us uh, what that looks like in Jira. So uh, Nishant, do you want to take over control? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Rich. Let me share my screen. Um, yeah, I guess everyone can see my screen now. Um, I've got, I've got um, Jira open. So when you're looking at the console while the test was running and the test failed, you can see the each steps uh, in the console um, as to what was done. And then at the end, you saw that a defect has been posted with the ID TPFR1186. 
So, so basically, when the test is failed, um, you know, Spot QA automation platform automatically pulls the defect into Jira, and you can see the G, uh, defect over here. So, you know, and you can. So it, it says the background color of the page is not as the expected one. You can also see that it was created four minutes ago and it was created by the reporter Spot QA, which is our platform. Um, and it it gives a, a, a brief about what the defect is. So the background color of the page was this, but it was expected to have this color uh, code. Um, and it also captures the screenshot and posts it into, um, into uh, Jira on one time. So, so basically as the overall test automation functional front end perspective, um, it does the whole automated job by not just executing the test, but also making sure that it also automates the defect management process so that it pulls the defects into Jira. Um, I'll, I'll hand it back to Rich now. Thanks, Rich. Okay. Thanks, Nishant. Okay, so um, I'm, uh, hopefully you can see my screen again now. So uh, now that next job is running in um, Jenkins. So if we go and have a look at that, we should be able to see the console output of that okay so that's now uh just going through the build process again so once more we're going through the cycle so now what i'm going to do whilst uh that is running is very quickly take you through the uh again that pipeline we're just going to go back and have a look at that pipeline and, and actually have a look at the spot qa job that we ran and what that actually means so if i click on this spot qa job you can see the project is a spot QA test, so all of the projects in Rapid Deploy are shown. You can choose the one you want. The target here is spot QA server dot JPET store UI test dot test 001. Uh, what that is is the actual name of the server that we're deploying to. It's a logical name in Rapid Deploy, a display name. The environment on that server that we're deploying to, and then some configuration view. The version is not really important here because we're running the same thing each time. And which, and you know, you can specify the failure pipeline. So what I'm actually going to do now is go to that project and show you what that looks like. So here's the project. It's a simple project. It's just got a simple uh, linear flow, although that could be branched um, very you know, easily. We can, make, we can run target specific. Uh, 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 thing. This, is, this is environment neutral. So this, this job could be run anywhere. So we can have a spot QA test that we set up here. And then we could actually have it running different tests on different servers and just pass in uh, different parameters to that test. So here I'm just doing a list files. And you can see here that we've got this at at list files path, at at, which is what we call a data dictionary value. So we could put an absolute value in here, or we can put in a data dictionary value. Uh, and that can be evaluated at deployment time to whatever it is for that target environment that we're going to. You'll also see an output parameter, list of files. Most tasks have an output parameter, uh, usually in this uh, syntax, dollar curly brace list of files, whatever. And that can be used for in any subsequent task. So here I'm just echoing that out, but it could be evaluated in a, an if statement or via a while loop or whatever it might be. So uh, if we go back to that data dictionary value, here we can look at the targets we've got specified. We've only got one here on the spot QA server. We can look at that and we can see that we have got some of these data dictionary values set to different, different values. They're, these are the values that are going to be used on that target server. So the deployments are all taking place on our Linux servers, but the Spot QA server is on a Windows server. So we've got some Windows uh, parameters here. And here you can see that target that matches to the target that we had um, in our pipeline. So I'm just going to go back. And if we want to have a look at what the actual uh, sort of Spot QA uh, task is doing, it's just actually running a piece of script. Now we can actually call scripts independently, or we can just embed the script code directly into Rapid Deploy. So here you can see the script that's running. It's just a batch script, which is setting in the right Java home um, and there and, and CDing to the right directory and calling uh, Maven test. Okay, so uh, let's just quickly go back and see where we've got to. Okay, so that job is now running uh, through. So uh, at this point, I'm happy to hand over to any questions and we'll have a look and see the deployment and leave that running in the background whilst we uh, answer any questions that anybody might have. Okay, so we have a question, Dave, do you wanna say I've see just what got, I've just got, yeah, I've okay. got some questions here actually. So one of the ones, the first question from uh, one of the 
guys on the on the team was about um or the audience was basically saying about rollback so i just wondered how how rollback or how how is rollback accommodated or dealt with if you have a an issue okay so um i think i showed you before uh and let's just go and have a look at that uh in the in the job plan uh you can have a rollback uh pipeline okay so uh when you uh if we go back here to to the actual job plan here you have this rollback pipeline which you can specify anything here that can run okay so when it gets to finish if you don't like it you can just click a one click rollback and that will roll back that version so if i go to um i get now go to previous jobs uh and um we see uh a successful job here a successful job here then you see you've got a button here which is um, based on start a new job based on the rollback configuration if you click that uh, so the in order for that to be there the job has to have run to completion um, uh, and then you can just click that if you've got the right priority and uh, it will just put the code back to the last build that the, the last version of code that was there before you deployed this version of code does that does that answer the question yeah, I think it does. That's, that's great. Thank you, Rich. So just a, just a question. I suppose one of the, on one of the diagrams we showed a bit earlier, obviously we, we didn't really talk about infrastructure. So one of the next questions is, is about, um, obviously, you know, a few years ago, a lot of the software that was deployed was what's called behind the firewall on yeah. premise. Um, what, how, how, well, I suppose I've maybe had to direct it to Nishant first, cause just, to, just to balance it out. How do you deal with kind of you know on-premise versus cloud or hybrid environments? Could you could you help with that answer, uh, Nishan? It's possible. Yeah, so SpotQA um, allows you to actually connect and talk to it through different uh, protocols. So you can use uh, REST API. We have an API exposed. You can actually also go directly through uh, you know command line through an SSH. Um, it it is it is not dependent on whether it is on. Uh, uh, on premise or on cloud, because even if you're talking on cloud, it is just like another data center somewhere. So, you know, we, we expose it through an API so that you can connect it through uh, Maestro anywhere. Maestro um, is, is the spot QA um, automation platform, the name that we've given, uh, just because we've not mentioned that. Yeah. Okay. Does that answer my question? I think it does. Yeah. So, I mean, that's so you're saying that you can cope with either it's a cloud cloud or exactly. on premise or, or yeah. hybrid cloud. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And then is that, what, what's your view on that with, on the, on the rapid deploy and um, mid vision side, Rich, is that possible to explain? Yeah. Yeah. So we, again, we can do the same thing. You can just define your servers, your infrastructure, you know, on this panel, the infrastructure can be anywhere. It can be, you know, behind a firewall. It can be in the cloud. I mean, the demo I've just shown you is on, you know, is on Amazon. So uh, we're just using one Amazon server, which is running rapid deploy connecting to another one. Rapid deploy can sit within Docker container. So that, in fact, this demo that I've run, uh, this demo.midvision.com, rapid deploy is running from within a Docker container. We, it's do, it can be Dockerized and download it from that. So we can deploy to anywhere. We can deploy via SSH um, or we can deploy via an agent. So you can place an agent on your server. Um, typically people might want to do that for Windows. Um, it can be run as a service. So yeah, you know, uh, similarly, you know, we can deploy to anywhere and, and, and you can, you know, through rapid deploy, uh, as I think I may have demonstrated or, or, or alluded to, uh, not uh, rapid deploy will also allow you through the connection. If the server isn't there, it can create new servers. It can also dynamically scale up and down. So when you run a deployment or a job, it, you can say, I want to add six more servers and it will do the deployment to, you know, it will add six more servers and do the deployment to those six additional servers. It will create them, start them, and run through, so running that job we ran, if I'd have changed uh, the number of servers from one to four, it would have created four uh, AWS servers, started them, and uh, I deployed that app to all four. So, yeah, it's very flexible. Okay. Um, just another one we got from uh, on the Spot QA side is obviously I know within the demo it looked like you were using uh, Jenkins. Um, where does Spot QA fit in that in the end to end cycle in the pipeline? Uh, oh, so, where you yeah. usually use Spot QA across that end to end journey, I suppose, from a dev point, dev test ops point of view, or yeah. dev QA ops. Um, um, if, if you um, um, 
Uh, so if, if, if you, you, while we were doing the presentation, you saw that pipeline where you had the blue pipeline and then you had the whole stuff of dev, uh, build, commit, build, uh, test, uh, stage, deploy, and, uh, and to production, um, if you remember that. You know, so for my uh, spot QA solution is a test automation um, solution which helps you to actually do uh, functional and UI parallel execution testing, um, you know, uh, and it's not anything to do with Jenkins. Jenkins is a build tool. What, what, how, how um, Spot QA solution works with Jenkins is just like you, you create a code, you know, um, you check it into Git and then Jenkins picks up and builds it. While it's building it, um, it also talks to our tool, which is the Spot QA automation tool, picks up the scripts and executes it as, as a part of the build. Uh, so therefore, the Spot QA automation solution actually sits in the DevOps cycle, sits within the test space where you deploy to a build, you do the unit test, you do the code analysis, and then you, um, you, you just give um, Spot QA platform to do the functional test, um, and then you deploy it. And then you, when, you, when you go to the next part where you're going to actually deploy to production, um, you know, you again deploy the build and then Spot QA test platform actually tests it to actually validate your deployment that you've deployed it properly, your application um, is functioning as, as expected um, as a part of your DevOps. Does that answer the question? So, so it sounds like what you're saying is that, that both rapid deploy and and Spot QA can work in harmony with with Jenkins and CloudBees. Is that is that yes, correct? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, build on that. Just one of the next question was about. So I think. Yeah. That's very useful. Thanks for clarifying that. The, the next one was about integrations. Um, obviously, there's. You know, unfortunately, it's not as though you buy one tool and then it, that solves all your end-to-end -end capability questions. So. How do you deal with integrations? This is this is directed, I think, at the mid vision side, uh, given the tool chain that you have within organisations. Rich, could you give us some kind of steer on, on how you deal with the integration question? Yeah, so uh, Rapid Deploy can integrate both inbound and outbound to other tools. We've got a lot of plugins that you can uh, choose to uh, to integrate with those tools. If I can just uh, share my screen, you can see, uh, you know. We go over here. You can have have a look at the plugin manager, um, and uh, it will show you, you know, some of the tools I've got installed here. So we've got integrations with, you know, you can see here lots of things: WebSphere, you know, here I've got um, Oracle, JBoss, so on and so forth. So that's integrations to allow us to do deployments. But you've also got inbound integrations. So any tool that um, uh, can make a web service call can call Rapid Deploy. You you saw the integration that we've built with. Jenkins, but you don't need to have a built integration. You, as long as you can make a web service call, you can call into Rapid Deploy, no problem. And Rapid Deploy can call out to any of those tools. And I think I showed you the RESTful web service call out during the pipeline, but you can also do that in the individual job. So Rapid Deploy can really sit in the middle of, of, of your you know, nexus of tools and communicate with all tools, both inbound and outbound, and you know, via plugins can deploy to many, many different um, uh, technologies, right? So, does that answer the question? Yeah, it's useful because I think it just shows how how comprehensive the the plugins that you actually developed, and obviously to a lot of the products that potentially customers have actually already bought. So, obviously, they, that's a big consideration to them. Thanks yep. for doing that. Just, so, just another one on on scale uh, that's come up as the next question was about um, back on the rapid deploy side. How what's what's the kind of scale of uh, deployment you've got in production globally what what types of organization could you give us some you don't need to name the names but just give us some some examples of what yeah. kind of industries or what scale you've done at, at, for this type of process so rapid deploy has been used in some very large banks they've done you know organizations that are doing 50,000 deployments a year or more um, you know rapid deploy has been tested doing uh, something like with 600 users doing concurrent deployments. So, so 600 concurrent deployments. So it really does work at scale to, um, you know, enable you to do a lot of stuff. You can rapid deploy can be clustered. So you can cluster rapid deploy across, you know, multiple servers to load ba for load balancing and failover. So, and, and it will integrate with your um, uh, active directory or Adam uh, on-site LDAP repositories for, you know, authentication through that. 
So it has been built for an, uh, as an enterprise tool. Yeah. Okay, and the final question I think we've got is for back from Nishant again. Is is obviously you know there's there's I suppose it's a similar question. There's lots of testing tools out there, Selenium, Cucumber, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. How I mean, do we have to rip, or would the customer have to rip those those tools out? You know, actually replace those tools with with the Spot QA platform, or, or is it is it a coexistence, or is it you know what how do you, what's the implementation approach, and and how do you, you know how do you how do you how do you address that issue? Yeah, so, um, so for so what we've done different with the Spot QA solution is um, we are not we've made it tool agnostic. We wanted to give the capability of test automation uh, to achieve end-to-end -end test automation, irrespective of whatever whatever type of software development lifecycle you're following, and be able to integrate and use tools, existing tools, or or the tool chain that we we provide as a part of our platform. So uh, you know, in the current world, there are or people use automation, there will be some or the other form of automation done um, for projects, but it will be limited to the tool which is selected. So what we wanted to do is we will help, we will not, we don't want that uh, effort that is involved in that automation to be thrown away, but we integrate it with our platform and use the same tool set which you have, as well as, you know, the rest of the capabilities to give you the end-to-end -end testing. Um, so so that's, that's where Spot QA solution uh, the automation platform is different. We are not tool independent. We are not tool dependent. We are tool independent, but capability driven. Okay. And the final final question I think is the one for Nishan is just about um, about kind of I suppose throughput. Um, is there any kind of customer customer benefits you could share around you know the kind of with and without Spot QA? You know what have customers seen as a you know the kind of I suppose with and without automation? Because obviously testing has been a very manual. And still is in a lot of organisations a very manual activity. So you know, after after deploying Spot QA, what what kind of impact and what kind of benefits are people seeing? So so for one of our customers, um, um, you know, uh, they they had a manual testing. They used to do manual testing cycles where they had around 126 regression scripts that they had to execute. Um, you know, as part of bringing bringing in Spot QA solution, automated solution, that 126 scripts actually came down to 26, which is basically optimization of tests, which we do as a part of our automated solution, and and the cycle which they used to execute for two weeks on one browser, we brought it down to two hours across multiple browsers in parallel. So Maestro um, or the Spot QA solution, um, I keep repeating it as Maestro, that's the name of our solution or the platform that we, uh, we, we have developed. Um, so the Spot QA solution Maestro actually allows you to do parallel execution across browsers and devices at the same time, which helps you to speed up uh, your execution um, X times across the number of browsers that, of your choice. And how we handle that is uh, we also we use containerization. So so basically, uh, as and when required to test on browsers, we spin up containers of you know and tests against the browsers and discard them. Um, okay, that's fantastic. So so what you're saying is it's like a what was that about an eighty percent eighty percent reduction in complexity from a script point of view. Yes. So it, it also it's also dependent upon the areas where it is. For some digital agencies, we bring ninety percent efficiency through the visual testing. Right. Uh, we give we we have the we have the capabilities of visual testing, functional testing, API as well as mobile, all in one platform using one single script. So so as a part of our Spot QA automation platform, it the. Even if you have automation, it's completely different from the traditional way of automation, where you will need to have scripts written for each of these different types of tests that you need to do. But with the platform, you you know you just execute one single script, and it will do the whole uh, different types of tests in, in in the same time. Okay, that's great. Thank you for that, Nishan. So the final final question, actually, or the final question is uh, just coming now. Is, it's about uh, you know if a, if somebody was on this call today and they wanted to try and get um, access to this capability and to you know deploy it and start validating it in their environment you know what's what's the lead time to actually you know a for example get get midvision rapid deploy up and working um, and what's the same question to the spot QA platform that you mentioned well what's the kind of human idea is it you know an hour a day, a week, a month, six months. What, what's it going to give you some order of magnitude? 
do, do you want to start off, Rich, first? Yeah. You go, you go, Nishant. Yeah, so, 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 to, so for Maestro, it, it, it depends. So, you know, if, if you have an automation, a bit of automation that is done, um, and then you want to actually integrate that with uh, the Maestro platform, then and it depends upon the, um, you know, the level of automation that has been done. Um, but if you want to use Maestro as a platform by itself without any automation at your end, then you know, it's pretty much just going in and deploying it into your server or using a cloud solution. Um, so it, um, you know, if, 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 you, it's, if it's on premise, it's a day, but if you want to just uh, you know, use our cloud, it's just more about having a bi-directional VPN or a connectivity between, uh, between, the, um, you know, uh, between our Maestro server versus where you're accessing from. Yeah, and for Rapid Deploy, it's very simple. You just go to our website, just click on the link to download Rapid Deploy. It, however long it takes you to download it with your uh, network connection, type on zip, start web app, and uh, basically it's up and running. It's also already got loads of plugins installed. Uh, from our website, you can then download some test deployments. So uh, Rapid Deploy enables you to import and export your projects or your pipelines, and if you, if you download from our website a sample pipeline and import it, it will import the pipeline, all of the pipeline steps, all of the jobs for the pipelines and the configuration, um, and um, you're, ready to, you're basically ready to go. So you can get Rapid Deploy up and running, so you can log in within about five minutes, uh, and you can start running your first jobs uh, you know, within about 10 or 15 minutes, really. I mean, in particular, if it's just sort of, you know, what a lot of people like to run is just, you know, the first way of doing automation is to sort of take their existing scripts and basically bring them into rapid deploy so that they're stored in an SCM tool and, um, you know, that they can access them from rapid deploy and then run them in a controlled, organized way, which they can see. And it's got, you know, it's got security around it and everything. And they can see exactly how it's being migrated through environments. Then really you don't even need any of the plugins. You can just, you can just do that uh, straight away from day one. So I'd say, you can be up and running with Rapid Deploy and, you know, uh, get it running in, a, in five minutes and you can be doing your first deployments in, you know, half an hour to, a, to an hour, something like that. Very wow, so that's, um, that's pretty rapid then. Because you, have, you called it, it rapid, rapid Deploy then. Rapid yeah, exactly. Rapid deploy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank, so those are all the questions we've had, we've had submitted today. Obviously, if there's somebody on the call has a reflection after the session, then... Um, we're happy to, uh, to field those calls and field those inquiries and questions as a follow-up to this session. Um, we obviously covered the Q&A, uh, which has been great. Uh, hopefully you got some value out of that, understood some of the kind of more real and operational things and the kind of benefits that you can do by using these types of platform. Um, so from a wrap-up point of view, um, just to say that three key points, I suppose, as, as if you're not already aware, DevOps is really here to stay. Uh, it's a pretty fundamental uh, capability it's a combination of you know people and processes and and platforms um, and hopefully what you saw today was a definitely an element of how you can apply processes and governance uh, and and platforms in a, in a smart way uh, automation is key so obviously to for, for, for rich Richard and uh, Nishant to show that end-to-end -end demo in, in within this 45 minute slot is a uh, is a big piece of activity and you know if you had to do it all manually step by step you would be here for quite a few hours um and as, as obviously as, i suppose as richard and nishant have explained with some of their customer examples doing that at scale you need to get the foundations right so actually making sure you architect it properly making sure you get that um all those building blocks in place for you to scale your devops and your digital uh, capability across your organization so just to wrap up as well is if, if you're interested in some more information, uh, just give me some links here uh, to their websites and also to uh, to make any inquiries around uh, their capabilities. Uh, obviously, they provide uh, software licensing and services for their products. Um, and uh, the last thing I suppose is just to say thank you for attending today's session. I uh, hope you've got some value out of it. Uh, we've enjoyed hosting it for you. And um, this is Andrew Turner from GNT Sessions. Uh, thank you, Richard. Uh, and thank you, Nishant, uh, from Midvision Spot QA for hosting and sponsoring this session today. And uh, look forward to doing further sessions with you uh, into the 2018 and the, and the future. Thanks very much for your time.